Well, a very good morning to you. And uh, it's, it's great, isn't it, to be uh, enjoying the summer weather. And uh, it's good to be here. Just share a few verses from Psalm 67. These are lovely verses. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Though your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let's share a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can come and we can seek your face. And you are a God who wants to bless your people. You want your face to shine upon us. And Father, we want to know you today. We want you to speak into our lives. We want to bring our needs and our hearts and all our being before you today. And we pray, please would you help us to know you. Please would you help us to, to hear you speak. And please give us the faith to respond to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our first hymn. And uh, it's a lovely, uh, it's an older hymn. Uh, it's a lovely one I used to sing when I was growing up. When all thy mercies, O oh my God. Oh, 
Well, that was great, wasn't it? And um, we're going to head over into the notices. And um, so uh, <clears throat> hopefully you can join us after the service uh, for our Zoom time. It's coffee and chat, and uh, that'd be really great. Uh, and then this evening, uh, we'd encourage you to join with us with Parkside Church. And all our music today is from Parkside Church, for which we're very grateful. But we're really enjoying uh, Alistair Begg's series on 1 Samuel on the life of David, and you'll find that really great. I'd encourage you to join with us on that. Uh, Tuesday night is church night via Zoom, and uh, we're continuing our series. And uh, this week it's Simon Chandler, and uh, it's a series on relationships, and it's on Paul and Silas. And uh, hope you can join us for that. Wednesday night is Beyond Belief with the young people. Thursday night we're praying for the nation and nations. Uh, and then... Um, uh, Friday night, uh, we're not. We're going to have an informal program for Young Life over the summer, and uh, but still be happening, but uh, less formal. And then next Sunday, uh, Youth Second Breakfast, and we'll be meeting at eleven o'clock for Glencroft Church online. And uh, as we've mentioned, uh, we're looking to uh, to make plans of meeting together in the future, and we'd ask you to pray about that as well. Let's uh, just share some prayers now. And as we pray for the fellowship and, and those around us, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can bring all our needs to you. Father, we just thank you for continuing to have mercy upon this nation. We thank you that uh, the, the COVID rates have gone down so much. And Lord, we thank you for treatments in hospital that is saving lives. Father, we do pray about the development of a virus, a vaccine for the virus. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, have your good hand upon that. And Father, this, um, this pandemic is affecting so much uh, of this world. And we want to particularly pray, Lord, for those whose jobs are being affected uh, by this pandemic. And Lord, there are those in our fellowship who are facing tough times in that area. Um, Father, we just pray, please, would you have your good hand upon them? And Lord, we pray that you would uh, find a way for them to have their needs met and uh, uh, to have job security as well. Lord, we thank you for many blessings, but we do pray for our dear brothers and sisters going through this particular time. Father, we pray for our missionaries who we support. We think of... Um, Anthony and Rena in Israel. We pray for them. We think of Jonathan and Annette Gilmar in Italy. Uh, Lord, please be with them, especially in all the heat in Sicily. We pray for Hisham and Elizabeth in France. In Carcassonne, please be with them and help them. And Father, we pray for Ruth as she wants to get back to Thailand. Just pray you'd open a door for a flight back there. Pray for Abby May as she goes back to Yorkshire camp soon. And Father, we, we do pray for Daniel and Elizabeth Moore as they're serving you in New Tribes Mission, training missionaries. Be with them and help them to get ready for this coming summer, this coming new term. Lord, we pray for Janet May. Just please continue to help her to get stronger and uh, meet all her needs. Lord, remember Jean and particularly pray for Jack and Joyce, her brother and sister, and the rest of the family at this time. Lord, we pray for our government and, uh, Lord, our leaders in all the different areas of our society. Lord, please give them wisdom and ability. And, Lord, we pray, please speak into our lives now as we sing these songs, as we read your word. And we pray, Lord, that we might follow you more, more deeply and love you more as we seek to be your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to hand over to Simon as we go into the children's talk. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you. And this morning, I'm going to tell you a story based on a story that Jesus told. Um, and it's about two brothers. And it's coming up soon in Luke's gospel, which we're going through at the moment. So here are two brothers. That one was a younger one. That one was the older one. 
And the older one, when he was growing up, he was always well behaved, always helpful around the house. And when he grew up, he used to work hard every day on the farm. But the younger one wasn't quite like his older brother. He used to get into scrapes and didn't really enjoy hard work. And well, he got really discontented with being on the farm and working for his dad. And he wanted to go and have a more exciting life. So one day he came to his dad and he said, Dad, you know, when you die, I will get half your possessions, won't I? His dad said, yes. He said, well, I don't really want to wait until you die. Can I have my share now? Well, I don't know what you would have done if you'd have been that dad. But this dad said, OK, son, here's your share of your inheritance. And he gave him his share. Quite a lot of money it was. And so the son then thought, right, well, I don't want to stick around here now because my dad will be looking over my shoulder, checking I don't misspend the money. And quite frankly, I'd quite like to misspend the money. So I'm going to go and live somewhere else. And he set off on a journey. Now, how do you think that the dad felt about that? His son had said something really hurtful. He'd, he'd you know, basically sort of said, I wish I, can't, I don't want to wait for you to die, dad. And now he'd gone off and he'd, he'd gone to, to live somewhere else. The dad felt really sad for his younger son. But the younger son continued to journey. He went quite a long way. And he ended up in a far country. And this place was nothing like the farm that he'd grown up on. There were all kinds of exciting sights and things to look at. He looked around and he thought, wow, this place is amazing. I'm going to have a really great time in this place. And, well, I guess that because... He had lots of money. He also had lots of friends. If you were here in the room with me, I might say, OK, who wants to be my friend if I share my bag of sweets with you? And I bet loads of you would want to be my friend. And I hope that uh, if I ran out of sweets, you'd still want to be my friend, but I'm not quite so confident. This young man, well, he had loads of friends to start with. And uh, he spent it well, I think he's there at a, a gladiator show, probably cost quite a little bit to get in, uh, a bit like the sort of equivalent of a football game, I suppose. But he did a whole load of other things as well. And it says in the Bible that he squandered his property in reckless living. He wasted the money. He spent it on some really quite bad things. But then things began to get bad because a famine arose in that country. Everybody was hungry. And the young man, well, he'd run out of money. And well, I imagine now that when his friends, who had wanted to be his friend before, when he asked them for help, they were not willing to help. They had their own problems. They were short of money themselves. They were hungry themselves. And so this man had nobody to help him out. And he thought, what can I do now? And there wasn't much work around, uh, but he, he managed to get a job working for a man who looked after pigs. And the man said, you can go out into my field and you can look after the pigs. So there, that young man, there he was, looking after the pigs in the field. But he had hardly anything to eat himself. And in fact, he was so hungry that he actually wanted to eat the food that the pigs were eating. Now, um, I don't know about you, but when I was at school, and I think it's changed now, but I remember that, well, school dinners weren't that great. And it, all the leftover bits from the school dinners, which, um, you know, the bits that were too horrible for anybody to eat, they used to scrape off and put them into these big bins all sort of mushed together, all lots of bits of fish finger and cold custard and cabbage and things like that. And they used to say that this food was sent off to feed the pigs. All of which teaches me that pig food is pretty disgusting. But this man was so hungry that he would eat, he would have wanted to eat the food that the pigs were eating. Now, in those days, the pigs used to eat something um, not quite as disgusting looking as cold custard, but maybe even worse tasting. These, these pods, he's so hungry he wanted to eat the pods. And one day he came to himself. He came to his senses. And he thought, what a mess I've got myself into. 
here I am, hungry, tempted to eat the pig food, and back at home, my father's servants have got more to eat than me. And he decided that what he would do is he would go back and he would say sorry to his dad. He rehearsed the speech in his head. He said, right, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he set off. And all the way home, he was rehearsing the little speech to his dad. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. And he really meant it, but he, wanted to, he didn't want to sort of stumble over his words, so he's thinking about it. But while he was still a long way off, his dad, who I think perhaps used to go up and look down the road every day, just in case his son was coming home, his dad saw him a long way off and it's his heart went out to him and his dad ran to meet him and his son started the speech that he prepared he said father I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son but he didn't manage to get to the end of his speech because his dad stopped him and he said bring the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his hand put some shoes on his feet and kill the fatted calf and we're going to have a big banquet, a big celebration, because my son is home. Well, everybody, or nearly everybody, was happy. There he is, um, giving the order for the party to be prepared. But while they were celebrating, the older brother, remember the one who'd always done the right thing and worked hard for his dad. He came back and he heard the music and he, he saw that there was dancing going on and he thought, he said to one of the other servants, what's, what's happened? What's the celebration about? And he said, haven't you heard? Your brother has come back. And the older son, do you think he was pleased? He wasn't. He was absolutely furious. And he said to his dad, he said, I can't believe you've done this. For all these years I've been slaving away for you and your younger son, my little brother, has just gone off and he's wasted your money and, and you know, you've never thrown a big celebration like this for me. Why are you doing it for him? And he refused to go in. Well, the father said to him, son, he said, you're always with me. Everything that's mine is yours. But it's right, it's the right thing to do to celebrate. Because it's like your brother was dead and now he's alive. He was lost. And now we've found him. Well, that's a story that Jesus told. I wonder, did the older brother join in the celebrations? But I want you to just finish by asking, where are you in this story? Because I think maybe we're all like a character at some point in this story. Um, maybe for some of us, we're like the younger brother when he'd first arrived in the far country. And he was seeing all the sights and looking at all the exciting things he could do. And just not worried at all about his dad, but just wanting to have a good time. We can be like that, can't we? Not, not really wanting to think about God, just wanting to do what we want to do. Or maybe some of us are like the young man a bit later when he was stuck feeding the pigs and hungry and just realising what a mess he'd made of his life but couldn't really see, maybe at the moment we can't really see a way out of it. We don't really know what to do for the best. Or maybe some of us are like that older brother. We have, we think, lived a good life. We have been good. And we can't work out what all the fuss is about people who, you know, become Christians and get forgiven because we think we've done okay. Look back at this picture. Uh, can you see the, um, the older brother there in the background, still sulking, still angry, not wanting to join in and really be happy about forgiveness and life? Maybe that could be us as well. Or maybe... We can be like this one here. We can be like the younger son when he came back 
home to his dad. And that's like us, when we come back home to God and ask him to forgive us all the things we've done wrong. And when we do that, well, that father didn't wait for the son to get right home, did he? He ran to meet him. And God is just so pleased when we come and we repent and we ask for his forgiveness. Where are you in this story? Thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Simon. And uh, that was great, wasn't it? Uh, we're going to get sing our second hymn, and it's one of my favourites. There is a hope that burns within my heart. Well, thank you. And uh, let's turn to our Bible reading. We're continuing our series going through Luke's Gospel. And uh, we're going to read in Luke chapter 14 and beginning to read at verse 15. Luke chapter 14, verse 15. And this is what the Bible says. When one of those who reclined at table with Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor, and the crippled, and the blind, and the lame. 
And the servant said, Sir, said, Sir, what you've commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation, he is not able to finish it all. And all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the year is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Well, may God bless that reading to us. We're going to sing our third hymn, and uh, it's a hymn called Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Jesus, hope for the comfortless, there by his love or shaded, sweetly my soul shall rest, heart is the voice of angels, born in a song to me, over the fields of glory, over the jasper sea. Sin cannot harm me there Free from the blight of sorrows Free from my doubts and fears Won't be a few more trials Only a few more tears Safe, safe, safe in the arms of Jesus Safe trust shall be here let me wait with patience wait till the night is o'er wait till i see the morning break on the golden shore Thank you. 
Well, we're going to look at this passage from uh, Luke chapter 14 and um, uh, I've called it real discipleship. What does real discipleship look like? And it begins with this story of this great feast. Um, Some years ago, Rosie and I had a friend um, uh, called Andy and he was actually a butler at Buckingham Palace. And uh, from time to time, he used to come up and stay in our house in Leicester and we would quiz him on what it was like to live in Buckingham Palace. And he would tell us all these different stories and it really was amazing. Um, but sometimes he'd tell us about the great banquets and the great halls where they were having the banquets. And often the kitchens were miles away and uh, behind the scenes, you know, there would be butlers literally running down the corridors with these great big dishes and occasionally you know, the inevitable happened and someone fell over on a corner and the, the food went sprawling, but there'd be some kind of backup plan. But there would be these massive, amazing events and, you know, just all the grandeur of these tables that were set. Um, so many years ago, um, we started a little business in the middle of a recession and uh, we got put up for an award and it was the best startup business of that year. I think the only reason we got it was we were the only business start, fool enough to start up in a recession. And uh, we had to go along and they sent us this invite. It said uh, it was a black tie event. I thought that meant that you had to just buy a black tie. I found out actually you had to wear a dinner jacket and a bow tie and, and all, of, all the things like that. And we went to this uh, huge banquet and we sat down at this table and there was so much cutlery. There's you know, the side of our plates going out sideways. You know, it was like the whole, a whole amount of cutlery for our whole family was just either side of our plates and several glasses and uh, lots of other things. Um, in fact, we, we weren't, we were told a little bit of the etiquette. We weren't allowed to smoke until after we'd uh, sung the, um, the national anthem. And apparently that's one of the etiquette at these posh events. Actually, not that we wanted to smoke, but um, that was one of the things we were told. But Jesus begins uh, and he's wanting to liken heaven and the kingdom of heaven to a great feast. And you have to understand that in the days that Jesus was living in, 2000 years ago, the, the, probably the greatest event that could happen in those days was a great feast. It was just startling different to anything else in society. And it would have been a long time in preparation. It would have been a very rare event. It would have been incredibly exclusive and desirable uh, that only the elite of society would ever have been invited to these great feasts. But it would have been the talk of the whole community as these events would be planned and then prepared for and then taking part. So as we come to this passage, we kind of need to have this, this picture in our minds of this staggering once in a lifetime event, an event that the hearers of Jesus would never themselves dream of being invited to, but that for their culture at their time was the pinnacle of events that you could be invited to. Just imagine, you know, a cross between invite, being invited to, um, you know, the, the opening Olympic ceremony in London, followed by dinner at Buckingham Palace. And, and you'd be kind of still then a little way off what this feast in the Bible is talking about. So have you got the picture? And Jesus is saying that when you've got that picture, this picture that you've got is, is a bit like the kingdom of God. This great feast, it's now ready. And, and so the master of this great feast, he, he calls his servant and he sends his servant out and he says, go and tell those people who've already got, had the invitation, go and tell them that now's the time to come. It's, everything's now ready. There was no sort of Tesco online deliveries in those days and 
So planning one of these feasts, you couldn't get it down to an exact date. You kind of set, yeah, the feast is going to take place sometime in the summer. And we just want you to be ready for it. And, and people understood that, you know, the, um, I don't know, the dolphin steaks had to come from far away and the turtle soup had to come from another place. And, and, and these, these things would eventually come and the timing would be dependent on when the re pre re preparations were made. And so this servant goes out. But those who had been invited, when the servant says, look, it's time to come, they all start making excuses. One has just bought some property. So I've just bought some property. I, 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 please excuse me. Another one says, well, actually, I've just bought five pairs of oxen. And I want to test them out. Please have me excused. Another one says, well, I've just got married. Please have me excused. And the, and the servant goes back and he goes back to his master and he says, they've made excuses. And the master says, OK, we'll go out quickly and bring in the poor and bring in the crippled and bring in the blind and bring in the lame. And so the servant goes off and he does that. And sometimes later he comes back and he says, Master, everything you asked me to do, I've done. But there's still some room in the feast. And so the master says, well, go out quickly again and compel people. Drag them in to my feast so it can be full. Have you got that picture? It's a lovely story, isn't it? And, and I, I'd, in my mind's eye, I can kind of picture what's going on. Well, What's the meaning about it? Well, the great, the great king, the great master here is God, isn't it? And the great feast is heaven. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us and it's, it's the most wonderful of places. It's a place where we will enjoy and be satisfied. And this story doesn't implicitly say this, but we know from the rest of the Bible, there's a great cost to this great feast. But the cost isn't paid by the guests, the cost is paid by Jesus, who died on the cross and paid the price that no one else could pay. And then we come to the servant. Now, who does the servant represent? Well, the king's servants, who are they? They're Christians, aren't they? They're the followers of Jesus. They didn't make the feast happen, but they're sent out to invite people into the feast and to do the master's bidding. And so if you're a follower of Jesus today, that's you and that's me. And then as we go further through the story, we find out there were those who knew all about it. They'd already be invited. And when the servant went to them and said, look, it's time to come, they started making excuses. The first one said, his excuse was wealth. I've just acquired more stuff. I want to check out my wealth. I'm focused on wealth. I'm not interested in this great feast. I want my wealth. And then another one says, well, I, I've got five yoke of oxen. Well, what's he doing? He's, he's developing his career. He's climbing up the ladder. He's expanding his business. Five yoke of oxen. Most, most farmers would have just had a pair. He's got five teams that are going out to plow the fields. This guy's really going for it in his business and his, his career. And then another guy says, well, actually, I'm not coming to the feast. I've just got married. My relationships are too important. And that's a great picture, isn't it, here, of those who say, well, actually, I'm not interested in the great feast because I'm looking for wealth to satisfy me. And some people are saying, I'm looking for my career, my business, progressing in this world, just getting up the next ladder. That's, that's where my focus is. I, I don't want this great feast. And then somebody was saying, well, my relationships, it's all that matters in my life. It's more, than, more important than knowing 
the king of eternity. And so people take the eternal issues and they trade them for things that don't really last. Well, we go on in this story, don't we? And the next, we find there are those who didn't think they were good enough. Well, who were they? Well, they were the, the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And it's all in verse 21, isn't it? Those who never expected to get invited to the great feast. Those who'd been written off by society. Though th these were those who you'd never see in the pictures of great feasts, would you? If you just type great feasts into Google, and you, and you see lots of big banquets. You never see crippled people. You never see blind people on them. They're all well-to-do, middle and upper class people, aren't they? These people didn't think they'd ever get invited. They didn't think they were good enough. But you know, this picture tells us that God's love is so great and it's so amazing. <laughs> and though we don't deserve it, God invites us and he offers. And he wants us to come and to know him. I remember um, some years ago, I used to have to travel quite a lot. And uh, one of the long flights that I often took was going off to America. And uh, I was traveling down to Heathrow and for another long trip and uh, flying out and visiting places and coming back and booked into economy. And, uh, you know, one of those little tight seats and you squeezed in. And as I go up to the desk to, to check in, uh, they take my ticket away and uh, they say, sir, we've got some good news for you. Oh, really? Yeah, we're upgrading you today. Really? We're up I thought, well, maybe they're gonna put me into premium economy, or maybe business class. They said, we're upgrading you to first class. Oh boy, it was a different world. There was a red carpet. I didn't have to queue up. I went down this other way. The, you know, instead of sitting on those really hard seats, you know, um, in those departure lounges, there was this place, it was like a hotel. The food was free. It was on tap. And then eventually they said, don't worry about the time. We'll come and get you when it's time to get on the plane. And then this lady came along and said, sir, it's now time to get on the plane. Let me help you. And uh, she tried to take my bags and she showed me the way and I didn't have to queue up to get on the plane. I just went straight in and they took me to the seat. The seat was huge that is, and, and it folded out, it made a bed. And they came along and they said, well, here's the menu for the flight. I opened the menu up and it said, you can have what you like, when you like, just ask us. And then they came along and they apologized to me and they said, well, Really sorry, sir, but uh, the masseur who normally comes on, and there's a little booth and you could go and have a ma massage on mid-flight. The masseur has been sick and we're ever so sorry he's not. I'm thinking, you know, how did, you know, um, this was a different world. Can you imagine these people, the lame and the blind and the poor and the sick, you know, to, to even be invited to, to, to the great feast. It's a different world. But you know, folks, that's what God does. He offers us a different world, a better world. We can put aside all our pain and all our suffering and we can accept what he's done for us. Isn't that great? Well, then the, the third group of people were those, it wasn't just those who didn't think they'd ever get invited. These are the people who had no idea there was even a great feast to go to. They'd never heard of it. And the servants told to go and compel them to come in. Do you know, I reckon that over half of this world's population, over four billion people, have never understood God's grace. They don't understand about heaven and they don't understand that Jesus died on the cross and they don't understand it's a free gift and anyone can go to be with God forever in heaven. Well, it's an amazing picture, but it goes on a little bit further because we also find out about this servant. And this servant 
had to do three different tasks. And the first thing he had to do, he had to go and invite people. I remember this, the servant is us. If we're a Christian, we're God's servants, aren't we? And he just had to go and invite people. He just had to say, well, will you come to the great feast? Some years ago, I heard a true story about a missionary traveling around in Turkey. And he came to this little Turkish fishing village, little town. And he found there a group of Christians. They're from the local community. And he said, well, how, how did you find out about Jesus? And it turned out there was a young man grew up and he joined the fishing fleet. But then one day he left the village and he went to the big port and he got a job on a merchant ship that sailed the seven seas. And one day that ship docked, docked in New York and he went for a walk around on the streets. And he was walking down the street, he got to a street corner and there was someone stood on the street corner just giving out little booklets. He took one. Now he couldn't speak English, um, but anyway, he kept it. It was a nice booklet and he put it in his coat pocket. And sometime later, he decided to educate himself better and he got a correspondence course to learn English. And he learned English. And then he starts going around the ship looking for things to practice his English on. And he remembered the little book and he got his out and it turned out that that little booklet was part of the Bible and it had a message in it and he found out about Jesus. He found out about the great invite and the great feast. And he gave his life to Christ. Eventually he got himself a Bible. And the more he found out about God, the more he started thinking back about the people in his little fishing town. And so one day he packed up his job in the Merchant Navy, went back, and he went back to his village and he started telling people about Jesus. And when this missionary arrived in this town, there were 22 people who were Christians in that little town. Now, I've often thought about that story, and I've thought about the person who was stood on the street corner in New York. I don't think that person will ever know about this until they get to heaven. For when they do, there'll be some great rejoicing. And you kind of just wonder what happened. Yeah, maybe that person had been stood on the street corner. Maybe they'd given loads of tracks out, but maybe not. Maybe they went home that night and some other Christian came to them and said, well, how did it go today? Well, not bad. Did you give many books out? Well, not many. Well, how many did you give out? Well, just one. Well, did you have a good conversation with the person you gave that to? Um, well, not really. Well, why not? We couldn't speak English. Well, what good is that? But you see, we've got an amazing God, haven't we? We've got a God who can take a leaflet given out on a street corner in New York and God can take that seed and he can water it and it can grow and it becomes a church in Turkey. And God's servants, you and me, we're called to invite people. And the Bible tells us that God will bring the increase, but we have to trust him. And so the challenge is, are we inviting people? But then the servant was sent out and, and the master said, bring in the lame, bring in the blind, bring in the cripples and the poor people. Not easy, is it? Yeah, leading the blind people, carrying the crippled, that servant did it. And later he said, Lord, I've done everything you told me to do. I remember some years ago, um, we were involved in a youth work and um, Young Life on a Friday night and it met on the other side of town. And there were some people from a village called Hallerton in Leicestershire, 18 miles away, some three young people said they'd like to come. And you know, for several years, every week, there was someone who drove out to Hallerton, 18 miles and picked those young people up and then brought them back in 18 miles. And they came to the meeting and these are just scruffy teenagers. At the end of the meeting, they took them back 18 miles and then drove back 18 miles. And that's 72 miles in one evening. And then that was Friday night. And after a bit, there's three young people said, could we come on Saturday night as well? Guess what? The same person, week by week, 
drove out on a Friday night and a Saturday night, 144 miles every weekend. No one paid their petrol. They just did it because they wanted to be someone who was bringing people into Jesus. And you know, I think that has a fruit for all eternity. The impact on those people's lives was immense. And God calls us to do all we can to bring people in. But the servant wasn't only told to invite, wasn't only told to bring, but the servant was told to compel, you know, to go out and, and persuade people, compel people. I remember as a young man growing up and there was a guy who was uh, quite a few years older than me and uh, one year on Bethel camp and uh, the, the, the young pastor tackled this friend called George. And uh, he said, George, are you a real Christian? And George thought about it and George said, well, I, I don't think so. And uh, the, the, the young pastor said to him, oh, you do believe it's true, don't you? George thought, well, yes, I do. Yeah, it's true. Well, why aren't you a Christian? I don't know, really. Well, you better give your life to Christ now, hadn't you? Well, I suppose so. And right there and then, they prayed. And George asked Christ into his life. He became a Christian, transformed his life. I think in a way that was compelling someone. He wasn't beating him over head. He wasn't making him do something he didn't want to do, but he was just encouraging him to take a step he never had done. And this is the servant's task. But you know, there's a verse in this passage. I love this verse. It's verse 22. And, and the servant comes along and says, Master, I've done everything you commanded. Master, it's done as you commanded. Think about that. Think about that for me and you. Lord, I, I've done all that you told me to do. But then he goes on and he says, and there's still room. Why hasn't Jesus returned? Because there's still room. There's still room for your next door neighbour and my neighbour. There's still room for your family member who's not become a Christian. For the people on your street, the people who we love, the people who we care for. There's still room, young, old, family, friend, still room. There's that lovely hymn, isn't there? Facing a task unfinished. We're going to sing it at the end. But we are facing a task. It's unfinished until Jesus returns because there's still room. And Jesus goes on from this passage. He's, he's explained all of this. And he said, I want you to really understand what being a disciple is. And he says three things. And, and the first one is this. We need to be those who love God more and others less. Jesus said this in verse 26. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And this verse is often misunderstood. It doesn't mean we've got to go around hating people. Hate there actually means to love less. It means that we have to love God most. It's the first commandment, isn't it? We will love with all our heart and with all our soul, with all our strengths. And Jesus says we need to put him first. And all the other relationships second. But you see, here's the truth. And we know this. When we do put Jesus first, all our other relationships get better. As we follow God, we become better husbands and better wives. We become better fathers and better mothers. We become uh, better children and better friends. This isn't meaning that we go and hate the other people, but it is meaning that we say that we're going to love God more than we love anyone else. And then secondly, Jesus said we need for, to be willing for discipleship to be costly. Verse 27 says this, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
It costs nothing to be saved, but everything to follow Jesus. Jesus speaks here, he talks about someone building a tower and he says, look, if you're going to build a tower, you, you check out that you can complete the whole thing before you begin it. And if you're going to go to war, you check out that you can actually finish the battle before you go to war. And basically, Jesus is saying, if you start something, you need to finish it. And we need to, to, to be willing, as we follow Jesus, to, for it to cost us. But we need to be willing to follow it through. We don't quit halfway through. We're, we're going to finish it. We're going to be his followers. We're fully in. And then thirdly, Jesus says, we need to be those who are willing to give up everything for Jesus. Verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Being a disciple of Jesus is not adding something to your existing life. It is going in a completely different direction. And we need to be willing to give up all that stuff so we can go in this direction. Because Jesus is not going in the direction we are. Jesus is going in the other way. There are so many things that are taking us in the wrong direction, aren't there? There are so many things that distract us from really following Jesus, isn't there? And there are so many things that just get in the way of following Jesus. We need to be willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. You see, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then I will, will what? Will totally love, will totally love Jesus. We will have total commitment. We say we're all in, we're not quitting. We're, we're following Christ. And we're totally in. The other stuff doesn't matter because Jesus has done that for us. He went to the cross. He's brought us heaven and he wants us to follow him. So what are the applications? Well, number one, have you accepted the invitation to the great feast? Have you accepted it? The price has been paid. It's an invitation. Do you know we could so easily make excuses, couldn't we? We could say, do you know, I just want to, uh, it's my possessions. that I want more possessions. I don't want to do my career. Or relationships. But all that stuff's going to fade, isn't it? None of us are ever going to say, do you know, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. Do you know, the door is still open. It's an RSVP invitation. Anyone can receive it and respond. God doesn't force his love on us, but he offers it freely. Will you come? Will you come to Jesus? And then secondly, are you living the servant life? If you're already a follower of Jesus, are you totally loving him? Have you got total commitment? Are you totally in? Are you saying, Lord, do you know, following you is everything. I'm willing to be in. And then we would ask ourselves this, have you got the servant's heart? That servant that said, master, it's done as you commanded and still there's room. It was no servitude to him, was it? He didn't go back to the master and say, master, you gave me this list of five things. I've ticked them off and I'm off. Now I've finished for the day. Now he went back and said, master, I I've done what you told me to do. But, you know, we could still get more in at that feast. Okay, would you send me out again? Thomas Wells was a medical orderly in the army at Dunkirk. He went over on a ship and his role was to, to treat prisoners as they got brought out to the ships. But he saw that the great need was to get people from the beaches to the ships. And he saw an abandoned little rowing boat. And he got into this little rowing boat. He didn't, there was no oars. And the only thing he'd use an oar was he took his tin hat off, which was there to protect him. And he knelt at the very front of the boat and he used it as a paddle. 
and he paddled up to the beach. And he couldn't take many people, but he filled it up with people and then he paddled back to the ship. He unloaded those. And for four days, he did that. Rowing this little boat and backwards and forwards. Countless numbers of people were saved. Every day he could do it, he did it to save people. Do you know, the Bible is clear. This, this wonderful picture that Jesus painted, this great feast, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to invite people, to bring people in. Thomas Wells, that picture of him paddling in his little rowing boat for four days, all day long, backwards and forwards, in a sense, that should be me and you, shouldn't it? We need to have that servant's heart and say, oh, with all our strength, we want to point people to Jesus. Master, it's done as you commanded. I've done everything you said, but there's still room. Let's share a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, that it's so clear and so true, we pray, help us to take it in and live it out. Father, we thank you for the great feast that's open for all. And we thank you that there's still room, there's still room today for many to come in. Lord, we pray for the, the power of the gospel to impact many people's lives. We pray for willing servants to stand on street corners, to drive miles to bring people, to do all they can, to be servants of the Master. We pray, do a work in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Was only one hymn we could sing at the end of this passage, and it's facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees. <laughs> Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees. A need that undiminished rebukes us lawful ease. We who rejoice to know thee, renew before thy throne the solemn pledge we owe thee.
Uh, so please join us uh, for teas and coffees. And uh, as uh, taking a line from Simon Brown, uh, Beth, get the kettle on. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, but that our Rebukes our slothful ease. We who rejoice to know thee, renew before thy throne the solemn pledge we owe thee to go and make thee known. There are the Lord's beside. Oh, yeah. 